My name's Drew. I helped organise this day. Um, we had a last minute cancellation of a workshop um, about researching companies from Portal Watch. So um, I decided to talk about um, local publications and why I'm involved in Bristol. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a, of a cold. Um, so it's completely unprepared and we're just going to have a chat about what we do and what you know, what works and what doesn't work and what's been good and what challenges we have producing stuff locally. Um, so I'll just say a bit about the Bristol Cable, introduce it and how it works. And then uh, Stephen from Southwood Star. Salford. Salford Star. And, uh, you know, down south. Down south. And, so Kat from Manchester Mill. And anyone else who's involved in stuff locally from other countries. Um, yeah, so we've been going about a year, so quite a new project. Um, initially, we spoke like all the local groups we could find, just about the fact that we had the idea. So rather than do our own thing and then show it to everybody as a finished article, we wanted to try and get people's opinions in the process as soon as possible. Um, we got a couple of grants that we were quite lucky with, um, and then we did crowdfunding, and now we've got a membership, so we're now a cooperative, um, so everybody you know, the member has a say in how we run and the future of what we do. We've got our first um, general meeting of members uh, happening next week. And yes, yeah, so we've got about 150 people paying a pound a month um, upwards to support the publication. Um, first edition we managed to do without any advertising um, the second one we had some very strictly controlled <coughs> advertising in to cover the printing costs we do 10,000 copies um, every two months and yeah we've got stuff online there's more chairs in here Sorry. Um, yeah and it's been really Good so far. I mean, <coughs> it's a struggle with everybody working, you know, obviously other jobs. Everyone's voluntary at the moment. We're trying to work towards paying people something, everybody who contributes something for their contribution. We don't want it to be something that is only available to people who, you know, can afford to volunteer their time. Um, and, yeah, we mainly do quite big investigations of local issues, so we don't do breaking news, obviously, it comes out every two months. Um, but we don't do loads of social media stuff, really. We share the stories that we've produced. Um, um, and, can, yeah, so... Can we ask questions as we go on? Is that okay? One, yeah, one sec, and then I'll just show you this. So this was one of the main spread of our first edition, as you can see that. But we, did a, we do quite a lot of infographics and stuff like that to try and break down information. And it's a thing about who owns the Evening Post or the Bristol Post, it now calls it's our local, local paper, which is obviously mainly owned by the Daily Mail. Um, and then that's our model, our model of how we're going to try and do things differently. Um, yeah, so maybe if we hear from the others about what what they've done and then we'll uh, then we'll do some questions and just get into a yeah yeah no mid up yeah yeah Hang on. ask away if you've got I just want to know if you have an online presence or is it is it prep print only? No we have a website as yeah. well. We yeah you put in copy on both yeah, we have some. We do have some articles that go straight onto the website and don't go into the paper. Do you work as cooperative? We're no, we're we're a, what's it called? Like a cooperative for the benefit of. Uh, yeah, 
Community Benefit Society. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so our aim isn't necessarily to just be like generating income for the workers of the co-op. It's to partly do that, but also to... Um, yeah. Just one more question. Yeah. Do you work? Are they qualified journalists or is there a mix? There's no one who's a qualified journalist. No. Um, there's some more chairs around here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Is there some experience that you can Um, Not really. No. We've got one person who I think did a journalism degree, but there's no one who's a professional. We're just making it up as uh, we go along, really. Yeah. Like but I think, yes, I think. But I think, like someone said in the, in the questions in the opening session, someone said, well, what are people trained in when they do journalism? And are you just trained how to write an article and, you know, the, the technicalities of it? You know, I think it's learning the technical bits isn't as important as sort of understanding how power works and you know understanding the place that you live and who's doing what and what's happening and that's where the stories come from. Um, and what's sort of the legals I suppose? Do you have legal advice or do you have some legal training? <laughs> well, no, we, we've, we've got a guy who's at he does um, uh, at the university does a. Who, um, yeah, has advised us, advised us about legal stuff. Yeah, we do have some advice. Yeah. Do you want to say a bit? Yeah, sure. My name is Stephen Kingston, the editor of Salford Star. Um, publication's been going nine years in May. That's why I'm only, <laughs> yeah, I'm only, I'm only 18. <laughs> um, we produced eight copies of a printed issue which came out three times a year. And there was 15,000 copies of it. The first copy that came out, we caused traffic jams on Solver Precinct because the taxi drivers wouldn't move the cabs they were so busy reading it. It was like a bomb had dropped on the city with the Lowry and things like that. Um, what happened was, the council, it's cut long, very, very long story short, we produced, I think it was eight issues. And then the advertisers one by one started pulling out because of pressure from the council and various organisations and bodies. Um, so for the last five years, we've been online only. And what we do is, we do investigative stuff, we also do cultural stuff, we do all sorts of stuff. It's updated every single day, which is a huge task, absolutely huge task. Um, and it's taken us five years to get the money together to bring it out in print again, and just coming out on hopefully the first week in April, if I can get it together in time, before the election. This, not particularly this one, but the latest, to, just to print this without paying anybody or distribution or anything, was £8,000 a time. We can't do it anymore. <laughs> so we're going to bring it out as a tabloid, something a bit like that, only uh, bigger, I think. And that's where we're up to at the moment. We set it up, just a bit of background, we set it up to give people a voice, in Salford, because it was only the Salford advertiser that was actually covering anything, and they weren't doing it properly. Um, <coughs> since then, it's very hard to give people a voice online. We do try, but it's very difficult. We're, at the moment, we're just swamped with cuts, um, fracking, bottom moss. We were down there every single day. We're getting about 10,000 readers a week on average online. When we come out in print, we're bringing out 20,000 copies. Um, and hopefully we'll go from strength to strength again, but it is a task. Okay. I'm Kat from the Manchester Mural. I'm the editor at the moment, but I'm not working with a lot of content. It's more admin I'm doing because there isn't a team. Um, all the, the old people left about a year ago and were supposed to close the mural, they call it quits, but I said I was going to try and run a campaign, build a new team, find new writers and editors. Um, so far it's been, it's been really hard because it's, it's obviously not the easiest thing to do, right? You know, investing stuff and political stories about local politics. But um, now we're going to do a course and Stephen's going to be the trainer. So that's, um, 
going to be another try to find people who actually commit to the project and um, get it back, back up and running. And it's um, in its heyday, it had a, an editorial collective of about six to eight people who would write um, and edit each other's stories. And they, they were doing an amazing job. They were mainly self-taught. There was only, I think, one, one person who had, was actually trained journalist. Um, and they're writing about local campaigns, documenting what was going on in political social movement, um, holding the, 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 the local leads to account, like big um, property investors, the council, um, big business in Manchester. And that's what we want to get back to really, to get back having, having lots of people on board to write, write the, the stories that need to be told. Because we really haven't got any any anything in Manchester going, well, Manchester Great Manchester, where the, the real stories are being told. Like Manchester Evening News, unfortunately, um, has gone down to yeah, churns and writing just press releases basically that they they are sent by the police and by the council. And, um, yeah, so it's been hard and obviously it's all voluntary work, so people give their, their time and energy for free, but I think it will it's 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 kind of more important than ever, really, to have alternative press um, and Manchester with everything that's going on, especially what we saw yesterday with the devolution um, health service being taken on. It's just so much that actually needs looking at and we have to look behind the headlines that are going on. So, yeah, if anybody's interested, come and speak to me after and I'll tell you how you can sign up and become a part of the team. Cheers. Got a couple of people from Slaney Street. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, we're from a, a Birmingham-based cooperative um, news, independent news retailer. Um, we produce about ten thousand copies every two or three months, depending on you know finances and contributions and things like that. We tend to do a lot of call out. Um, we distribute them around the area, we put them for letterboxes um, on streets in our area. We also give them out to political groups, uh, trade unions, cooperative organisations, anchor streets, and uh, anything locally. And we try and kind of feed back as much as possible. Uh, we use that as a source of outreach and then gain new articles. So we had like a really good article a couple of months ago from uh, I think it was like a kind of Bangladeshi woman society who we'd never spoken to and they just sent us in a thing saying, would you print this? Found it, put it straight into our next print edition. Um, but it's a slow, slow work in progress, I think. Um, part of the issue is kind of first, but first and foremost, just organisation. Because I don't do anything that exciting. Most of my work has been to try and get distribution rotors set up, and like people contactable all the time, so like no one's kind of left by themselves doing bits and bobs and feeling isolated. But instead, that like, we all know we're doing stuff at the same time. We can go out in a group, get whole like swathes of areas done. Uh, and also turn up to kind of like events like this and other ones as well where we can get a voice out there and heard. Um, from my perspective, one of the difficulties is we've kind of come out of a weird combination of a kind of left political milieu and the student movement as well, which means that a lot of our language and writing tends to be more focused towards a sort of like high-end theoretical level or based on kind of like council cuts and kind of numerical stuff. And the problem with that stuff is it's, it's quite dreary, I find, a lot of the time. Like for myself, uh, living in Birmingham and dealing with the effects of council cuts and political corruption and things, it's actually quite demoralising. And like, we need to have an idea of like a more personal face. But so one of the things I was hoping to get out of this was not just to talk about the project, but also to learn a bit about how to do the um, best kind of investigative journalism we can as well. So like, some people might know we're moving like uh, the Cadbury's factory abroad and like basically doing that all like it's, it was a huge part of the area of Birmingham. It's got the whole region kind of around it devoted to like what it was, and now it's being shipped off for basically profit purposes. But I want to get in there and be able to speak to people and say, how is this affecting you as a person? What does it mean to you, you know, to, to be a kind of precarious worker? Uh, I don't know how to do that yet, you know? Um, same for, I've got contacts in the DWP who are absolutely sick of sanctioning people, watching, they're feeling like depressed and anxious. Like they haven't, a lot of them are getting counselling for this sort of stuff and we need an avenue to kind of let this stuff out. But it's kind of doing it in the right way and that's kind of one of the things that is a challenge. But at the same time, we're getting a very good response and we're starting to like, build up more and more as the uh, issues become more pressing, right, you're going to be you know, to add. Uh, you can go and do a lot then. <laughs> um, I do more of the editing stuff and commission to get people to write articles. Um, 
Yeah, the way we, we've been funding at the moment is that we have, we like, we are like a co-op, so we have like members, we've got about 43 members I think at the moment now, and everyone pays dues of between £1 to £10 a month, depending on how much they can afford. And um, we get about half the money to run our paper through that, we've got a website as well, so that's a lot cheaper. And the rest we've just been doing that advertising for kind of sympathetic organisations. Um, we are, we are like looking to like try and do like fundraisers and see how people do that kind of thing because we don't have much money and that's always like a bit of an issue. Um, there is one, there's at least one seat here if anyone wants one. <coughs> So yeah. this, is, this, is, this is the paper, yeah. just so you know it exists. Why are you called Slaney Street? Slaney Street is a street formerly in Birmingham. That is Slaney Street after we got bombed by the Germans in the Second World War. I don't, I sound like I don't like Germans. <laughs> um, um, but the reason it's called that is the Chartists, which were an organisation in the 19th century who campaigned for most of the stuff we really have now, but like the vote for all working class people and stuff. It was one of the first working class organisations that started. They were headquartered in Slaney Street and it was kind of like a little hub of radicalism in that time. So we named it that. The other alternative was the Birmingham Beacon, which I thought sounded a bit pretentious. So <laughs> it's been this one instead and it's got a bit of a, I don't want to say brand, but you know what I mean. It's a bit memorable to go with that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, good. Should we yeah. get out? Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I just, um, I, I just thinking because of a lot of um, so far organisations that I've heard and seen today have all been print, and I just wondered if anyone wanted to hear a bit about um, radio, because I do quite work in radio. Um, we set up, um, well, when I say we, these are all much cleverer than I am, uh, uh, set up a community radio station. Uh, I think it was about five years ago it was originally sort of incorporated or put together. And um, so part of the part of the process of doing that is you, you have to create a I think it's called a um, memorandum of, of commitments or something, or I forget what it's called. Uh, it's something to do with commitment, the key commitments, you have to you have to make key commitments to off So the big thing about setting up a community radio, uh, if anyone's thinking of doing it, is that you have to First of all, we'll have a governing uh, organisation, uh, so that we could be a community interest company or, or a private limited company, or there's various other um, things that Ofcom will accept to uh, as to, to become a community station. Um, one of the things, obviously, though, is you, you have to be not a not-for-profit uh, organisation, I think. Um, but the so the biggest challenge is to create a key commitments document that actually really meets what your um, organisation wants to do. Because once it's in there inside Ofcom, you're you're beholden to that for a five-year period. So whatever you tell them at the beginning, you basically have to stick to. Otherwise, they find you or get on your case. Or in quite a lot of cases, they'll just uh, re remove your right to broadcast uh, if you if you break your key commitments to enough extent. Um, I suppose I wanted to kind of like bring a cautionary note to, to, the, to the to the scenes because currently uh, this is why I'm clutching this NUJ. Uh, thing because currently the organisation of our radio station is very uh, uh, pyramidal, well it's not even pyramidal, it's more like a snowman, it's like one person at the top and a really fat body of other people underneath. Um, and uh, despite the fact that we've got these key commitments that, uh, and, and the fact that we're a community interest company underneath, uh, so the radio station is called Destiny 105, that's what, what I work for, uh, in, in Oxford. And um, But there's a, there's a holding company which deals financially and deals with Ofcom, uh, that's called uh, OX4CIC, if you want to look it up on the company's house, you're welcome to do so. Uh, you can also, it's quite handy if you did want to set up your own radio station, if you look at OX4CIC, that will that will show you in the company's house all the, the documents that we have to submit to the company's house to uh, incorporate, and then also you can use OX4CIC to look up uh, on Ofcom for Destiny 105, because we've changed our name a couple of times, so sometimes the documents get hidden. Um, but yeah, just my cautionary note, I suppose, is that um, it's very easy for well-meaning groups of people to uh, get dominated by, by uh, say, tech, you know, people with a lot of technical abilities or bureaucratic or financial skills. And because the rest of us are just presenters, so most of us are DJs, uh, I'm, I'm an interview, interviewer presenter, um, and 
so we don't necessarily have the sort of financial and, and bureaucratic mindsets to, to deal with the external. Um, but it's really important, I think, that when you start any enterprise, so I think that goes from being a magazine to being a TV station, it's very important that you have clear, uh, uh, you know, the, the clear kind of goals and aims and that, that everyone agrees to a key code of conduct that everyone abides by when they part of it and that if you're going to have membership that, you know, when, you, when people sign up to membership that, that they understand what it means to be a member and what, their, what the rules and regulations are and stuff because I think there's a, a lot of ignorance about the, the law and procedures and stuff amongst the general, you know, so people, as journalists I think it's useful for us all to make ourselves aware of things like uh, how how the, the, the companies that we work for are run and what rights you've got within those companies. So, you know, if you're working for a newspaper, do you have other members, uh, others, you know, if you were a journalist, can you become a shareholder? If you become a shareholder of your newspaper, does that mean you've got rights to vote for, for the directors and that sort of thing? It's really important that we all know that information so that we can make good choices. So, yeah, that's all. Yeah, so I'm just gonna, <coughs> Take questions or comments and we'll just carry on with the discussion. Oh, so I've got one, two, three. Yeah. I just wanted to ask about um, how the different publications make editorial decisions. And I guess, because I think there's quite a lot of discussion. People talk quite a lot about the importance of media in democracy. And I guess maybe I wanted to ask how democracy comes into media and how you take those decisions and whether. Yes, we've had a process for setting those projects. So which one's that? We don't have any. <laughs> I mean, when you, you know, at the end of the day, most community magazines are based on nothing. You know, there's no money. We do have a board of directors, but they're just people that were involved in the first issue, basically. People who were affected by the houses being knocked down, more or less. They let us get on with whatever we want. We don't have any rules. Don't have a membership. We don't have a constitution. We have a constitution, so we have to do by law. We're a constituted community group. But apart from that, there's nothing. People know, you know, it's a gut thing. Community politics or community journalism is a gut thing, and I don't think we need a set of rules to do that. You know what I mean? If people, somebody's getting the the transport disabled transport taken off them by a council court, then everybody will say, "Well, that's wrong. Let's talk about it." You know, we don't. I don't think anyone that writes for Salt for Stars wants to write a piece about how great Salt for Council is or how great Bill Aldings are or how great the cuts are. So we don't need that. It's an inbred thing. I, I don't think we need it. I, I would totally disagree. I think you've got to be very careful. I mean, I think That's how we get ours out every day. But I mean, but what's the stop? Sorry, sorry. Just quickly ask, what's to stop somebody coming in and taking over your organisation? What, what safeguards are there against that? What safeguards are? Well, the editor had time to piss off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to come back on, on that as well, for, um, yeah. So in terms of making editorial decisions about what goes in and what doesn't, um, so there's two ways. Um, so like at this next general meeting, we're asking the membership. <coughs> we're not saying we're not saying we'll write about anything <coughs> you want, or you can submit anything. Well, we do say you can submit anything you want, but. What we're going to ask people to do is prioritise the issues that they want to most see us cover in the future. So we, we're going to select like five broad themes of things for the next few editions and ask people to put them in priority. So you're asking the members? We're asking our members because we, we do have a membership of yeah, like about 150. So yeah, we'll ask them in an exercise, we'll present these are the general themes that we're thinking about covering, which do you most want to see, and we'll just ask them to prioritise them. But it's not a free fall. And the other thing is that <coughs> um, in a sort of editorial meeting is, um, so we have a thing on the website where anyone can submit a story, so they submit a pitch and they very briefly say what the idea is, and then one of us will get back to them and say, well, how, how does this fit what we want to do? So we have an editorial guidelines policy thing on the website that says this is what we'll cover, this is what we won't cover, and this is why we were doing what we're doing. So how does your story fit that? 
Um, and you know, sometimes people come with, to us with stuff that we just don't want to push and we just decide no. I mean, it's quite a small group of people making the decisions about what goes in. And we haven't, so far, had like major fights about what goes in and what doesn't go in. Partly, you know, for the reasons that we're generally all coming from the same place. I hope that helps. Anyone else want to making decisions about what goes in and what doesn't go in? Well, at the moment, this is only me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what? One mind, so, it's a great uh, it's like, I made the decision a few years ago and was an editorial collective. They had weekly editorial meetings um, where they would just discuss what was going to be covered and then other contributors, writers, like would send in story ideas and then obviously get lots of press releases and people sending in ideas and saying, what do you think about this? <coughs> um, so, yeah, it was, look, so the, the attempt was to actually have it as like a collective decision and discuss the ideas and obviously, um, yeah, cover what was going on, what was going on. <laughs> um, the way we have it is we have our members, we have a members meeting roughly every six months and we have like both like motions and elections there. So we elect um, editors and two like workers who get paid to do stuff for the newspaper and also like kind of broad decisions of what we want to do. And then for those six months, the editors, we have six of them, they meet every two or three weeks. We got fixed about it and they like kind of do the best to implement what decisions the members want. And we just do that way. <coughs> so it's like in, in the interim before those points we have like an online discussion forum like Lumia, um, where we will basically like tell our members to kind of go and like say stuff and like quite often we'll have like an indicative vote on something if it's particularly controversial or something and that tends to be the way around it. So like you know, our, our members will then just sort of say we kind of want this or whatever and then so we will kind of take that into account. And then if people aren't happy with that, they'll be both those because we selected. But I mean, it sounds very formal, but it's not because it's just like we just kind of let the people who want to do the stuff basically. And like we had a much bigger editorial board before, I think, didn't we? It was like 12, wasn't it? 10? Yeah, the half of the internal. Yeah, yeah. So, so we just like, well, it's six. <laughs> we just made it a good set number of people who wanted to do it basically. Yeah. Um, cool. but I think it works pretty well. Um, I think I have one hand here and then here. Yeah. <coughs> a question everybody has, and that's to uh, raise the issue of uh, ideas for making community media, media sustainable. Yeah, I mean, uh, Steve mentioned it. it's not only it's me and you know, <coughs> Steve from hell trying to keep the thing uh, sort of start going. Um, and that is a problem for a lot of community leaders that the fact that well, there's, you know, like I said, there's no money. There's uh, you, know, you, you can apply for various things, apply for grants and stuff like that, but then you spend a lot of time chasing the grants and coming, filling in the forms, and then you'd be holding to the organisations that have given you the grant and stuff like that, and you think about what happens if, if the funding is withdrawn and so on. And, and I mentioned this in the other session about, um, they were talking about mainstream journalism and radical journalism and stuff like that, and that is that uh, you have a situation where, um, you know, uh, if organisations like um, thinking in particular, of, well, as an example, Pits and Pots, the one I mentioned earlier, sort of the area of the program, um, which just disappeared. It was a really good uh, local site which focused on uh, local politics. I mean, set up by a guy who just wanted to, to, to do something about local politics in, uh, in Staffordshire. Uh, and then that disappeared overnight because of the fact that he couldn't do it anymore. Uh, and, and the funding dried up. Um, so I'm just wondering if people have got ideas about about uh, funding streams, getting money, sustainability. I suppose the other aspect of sustainability is is the base that has of volunteers who are willing to chip in and, and, and do it. But my impression is that a lot, a, a lot of these uh, sites, there are a very small number of people are trying, to, trying to run uh, an organisation and <coughs> attempting a mammoth task, as is the, the task that Steve's got that, that, uh, uh, 
Did you want to speak? Did you want to answer that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> good. Great. It's good. Someone's got the answer. <laughs> well, give one answer. Anyway. <coughs> but, uh, I'm kind of sort of from a the outlet that's been running for real years, and we've been going about eight years now. Again, very small group of people, one full time worker, which is me. And the, re the way that we've been able to fund it is basically on a subscription system. So I think it's taken us down your way. Sorry, can you hear? No, not really. Can you speak right. So people take out a monthly standing order and then we send them a DVD or a download every two months. Increasingly, what we found since 2008 is people can't even afford £3 a month, which is what it used to be. So the, the individual subscription has been going down. But what's been going up is the rank of file change in the subscriptions that we get. And we do a lot of um, coverage of workers' struggles or work with. Um, Workers, when they're taking action to sort of use it as a political weapon, really, we're finding that, especially United Unions and Branches have got money, um, and Trade Council have got money. Um, so you start going around your local area, just go around, if that's the sort of area you're working in, there are people out, you know, like our own, our own movie, if we really want our own media, then our own movie has got funds. And whether that's individuals, trade bank, or trade union branches, they work for third people, then, then you just have to go and find it. I would say don't bother with funding, yet, so it just takes up all the time, like you say, and then you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. With a couple of audio sessions. Yeah. Can I answer that? Yeah. The way we do it, um, apart from donations, I mean, when this was in print, we had about 20 donation tins in shops and stuff out around Salford, and they were full every single time we brought it out. Not with pennies, but with pounds and stuff like that. You know, there was lo absolute loads. Since we've been online, what we've been doing to sustain it um, is we've been doing other projects. Don't forget it's a knowledge economy. And if you can put that out, you can put other stuff out. So we're getting trade unions asking us to do branch magazines. So at the moment we do Bolton and Salford Unison branch magazines three times a year, which is paid. We actually get paid for doing that. We do flyers and stuff for local um, I wouldn't say, well, charities and people that want to reach the community to know that we can do it with graphics and the, w the words we use and things like that. So we, and we're not saying it's a great income, it's not, it's less than the minimum wage. But we do get an income from the paid work that we do on the side, which has its own issues, because if you're so busy doing that, you can't do that. And that's the other problem. Um, but that it, it's the knowledge that you get, you know, and hope, you see, if the people with the money, and I'm going to talk about Salford, people the, with the money in Salford, people at the university, um, obviously the developers, the regeneration organisations, the property developers, things like that. We should be getting money off, like the university for instance got a journalism course, now you think we'd be getting one of the two of us in once a month maybe to talk to our students about journalism, given that all their students seem to come to us asking for work experience. <laughs> um, they won't touch us with a barge pole, because that's one source of income gone. You know, Manchester Met have got us in there, Sheffield's got us in there talking about community journalism and stuff. But in Salford, anyone with any money has closed the door completely because we're investigating them, biting the hand that should feed us all the time, every single day. And so we should. That's, what, that's the job, isn't it? Um, but you can sustain it with your knowledge that you've got of doing things like this. You know? Cool. Yeah, I just wanted to... Oh, did you want to... Yeah. Just thinking about a couple of other things. We are constantly aware of the kind of, like, need for money basically um so like we try and build up as many kind of links with like your local groups as possible and that also includes like cooperative groups as well we've had a lot of support from um like kind of student co-op groups um the cooperative group generally um but our adverts and stuff for us and will give us little bits and bobs when they can um you, you might even get an office on them at some point because they have a lot of buildings in Birmingham. um the other one as well is just basic things like fundraisers and like a bit Dull, but actually it can be a good way of just like having something that's a bit stress free and getting a bit drunk and listening to some music while at the same time getting money in for the paper that can just top up the extra bit you need to like pay for people and like the cleaning costs basically. Um, and I, we, I think we might be looking as well at just like a wider list. Yeah, that's one thing we did do um, with a local chip shop that had just started up. They asked us to put leaflets out and we did it with the papers. So then we were able to pay our volunteers money according to how many papers they handed out as well. So it wasn't just them doing it on their own back, but we could give them a bit back for it. Um, like, oh, I wanted to try and keep a little bit towards the paper as well, but the decision was to just give it to the volunteers. I mean, that's better. Um, so that's the other way we've kind of managed to motivate people and keep people engaged as well. Cool. So
So yeah, I just wanted to address the community radio time I'm doing that in the course at the moment with the Fuckham, I can't be very bad at saying that, but Fuckham Community Radio. Uh, those of you who are not from Manchester, this is the breakaway Man United supporters who set up FC United Manchester, the name due to that, because that's what I wanted to say to the Glazers. Um, and they, as I say, do a community radio thing, and they've gone through all the legality side things. If anybody wants to set up for other people to contact them. Yeah. Is anyone else? Well, Carlos, it's interesting if anybody else is involved in any other um, like local media stuff that they just want to tell us about. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I'm from a group that's been doing a website in Sheffield called Alt Chef. So it's, it started it out as a group of about eight people just saying we're doing alternative. It's not really. It's not a print, it's just a website, that's it. So we said, well, we'll make it a light organisation. We only meet together face to face once a year. Uh, so this is the way to do it, like, without any funding. And then we just uh, we just got a massive database of all the organisations that they want to help publicise. We get all the mailing lists and we just sift, sift through and we uh, list all the events that are going on, all the organisations that are going on. Um, some news snippets, snippets of news, but we're not really... Uh, you know, because we're all busy working, you know, it's just a volunteer thing, we're all too busy to do too much. <coughs> you can make it uh, sustainable by doing that, and, and because it's like, uh, hopefully it's the go-to place if you want to know something about everything from like, the, you know, green, green movement through to feminism in Sheffield, or, you know, and things like, just by being there, you can go for years and years before, kind of, use it as a source of information. How long did they go? Since 2008. Oh. Sure. Yeah, I know you struggle with your phone. Have you ever asked you the community you write for to assist in writing your research? And I'm sorry. Well, what, what other community you, you're writing for? You do. The whole of songs. The whole yeah. songs. So don't get asked, don't you put out in your paper if you need someone to assist in your research, can you do research with offline and research? Mm -hmm. There's someone in the council might be. A better access to the council, so we say it's in the council. Do you ever, like, but that's a source of funding, but not money funding, it's just time funding, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever make that explicit, like? I mean, I mean always, because you've got like, a leadership or a community that you're writing for. People give us stories all the time. You know, yeah, yeah. Our stories, and not, it's not all sat in our garrets thinking, no, what should we do today? Do you ever go out and ask the community for it's more? Of course we do. I mean, we're like sh mule, mule house for about two years now, so constantly just having open meetings, inviting people to come along, volunteer, and like, you know, this kind of thing. So, Putting out adverts in your paper as well, so when you actually do go out and give them out, you always have something like to say, please write for us, come help us, mm -hmm. and then come join us, and you get to say what you know, what you kind of stories you want to see. Are we like a specific story? Is it a specific story? Does anyone, you know, consist of all? Actually, there's always people out there. You talk about citizens' journalism. Because we tried that and it was all libelous when it came back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, that's, quite, that's quite interesting. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Exactly, yeah. I mean, the way we do it, the way we do it, and we gave out the world's first ever citizens' journalism certificate award, and the way we do it, is we'll go and interview somebody and then transcribe it, go back, you know, put it in their words, then go back to them, they edit it, because if they haven't got the skills to do actual journalism, they edit it, and then it goes in under their names, they have the final edit over it. But it is their story in their words, just might not know how to structure it or whatever. We do a lot of that, a hell of a lot of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we do the same thing, yeah. But I mean, as far as, Asking the community to write for us, it's very difficult because, like oh, everyone said at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Someone could, was it your story about my company? There's things I don't know about the company, you know. Yeah. Something I see, you know. This happened over that fellow man says, I know, it's just today, I've got an envelope of such a fellow, you know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of good journalism is about who you know. You know, it's about, like, making contacts with people in companies and the council and you know people who are gonna whistle blow and feed you information and yeah yeah I mean as someone just 
writing stories, you know, it's impossible to know everything that's going on everywhere. It's all about, it's all about um, most people. Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, to say it again. Community Performance Power UK. Uh, yeah. We started off as a movement about, what, 10, 15 years ago in India by a guy called Shabbat Sharma. Um, we were running workshops to, tell, to teach people how to tell their stories through comic journalism. Uh, just everyday powerful stories about people's lives that um, people would like to share. Um, so we basically, anyone who comes to these workshops with any experience, you know, uh, they, most people have actually never drawn a comic before. Um, and we kind of publish grassroots media and put on exhibitions to try and just share these stories for free. Um, all the workshops are free, and we travel and we put them on free. Yeah, we managed to access a small class of community funding so far, but because we're also working in visual arts, we actually don't have the arts council at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, this is a way that we have tried to kind of, uh, well, it's not us, it's Shabazz who started it, but we've got trained in comics journalism through him. Um, we're, we're quite a young, Organisation in the UK, we've only been for them for a year, but we've just got our first pot of money to run some workshops within the community. This, this book that we've got here is one of the first sets of workshops that were last summer, um, but it's just a really accessible way of, of people sharing stories that are relevant to them. And we don't have um, any kind of remit when people come to these workshops, it can be about anything. Um, so, yeah, we get a very, very broad, diverse range of um, stories. Um, we're thinking of ways in the future where we can actually focus it more to specific political causes or social causes um, and make workshops more focused and then obviously have kind of themed pamphlets that deal with different issues. Um, yeah, that's us, but I'm not maybe it related to what the gentleman was saying at the front. And if anyone wants, because the we're a workshop, it's not there by themselves at all, and then whatever, we can chat about that so people come down and we'll do a workshop and uh, yeah, get to get people to come on what What's yeah. the name again? Community Comics Power UK. At the moment, we're based in Leeds. Community Comics Power. Power. Yeah, UK. UK. <laughs> At the moment, we're based in Leeds, but um, long term, we are looking to branch out across the whole of the UK. And with this uh, arts council funding that we're hoping to get, we would like to extend that to um, <coughs> other other counties as well as Yorkshire. So to kind of establish contact in Manchester, Birmingham, these places would just be wonderful for us. Um, and if you're interested in just picking up a book, we've got a limited amount with us, but. Um, then we'll get access to a photocopy of all your But yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> Cheers. Do you want one? Yes. We haven't got long, so if there's any burning um, questions or things we haven't covered at all, then yeah. I think, I think what you're doing is fantastic, and everybody's com each one's completely different. I can see that, and you come from a different place. But what I wondered was how your kind of, uh, let's say, bottom-up grassroots journalism segs with professional journalists because I was in the, um, the session just before and we were talking about radical journalism in main big media and how you know how can you how can, how can you seg the two because there are a lot of professional journalists who want to do radical stuff and they want to be part of that how does it work does it work huh. can I have a chance for that I was a mainstream political, uh, mainstream journalist for uh, 15 years, freelancing for everyone, The Times, Elle magazine, Sky magazine, just 17. I had my own column. <laughs> I was a lot younger. <laughs> um, so I've done it all, and um, you do a thing called Trojan Horse Journalism, where you pretend to write about something, and you're actually writing about something more interesting underneath it. Yeah. So, like, for instance, when I wrote for the Manchester Evening News, um, the only way you could get stories of working-class struggle in there was on the women's page, because the editor never looked at the women's page, <laughs> because he thought it was all periods and lipstick. <laughs> so I had this deal going with the features editor, where everything I wrote went into the women's page, and it was all about women fighting incinerators and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> but he never looked at it. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. You know, um, but it gets to the point. It gets to the, well, two things, right? First of all, it gets to the point where if you're a mainstream journalist, you try and you try and you try. And I can tell you millions of stories about, I've just been talking about it out there, about how stuff gets censored in the mainstream. Um, and you can't get it through anymore. So you can say, yes, well, I will try my best to do it. I didn't get into journalism to interview Buddy Coronation Street barmaids, which is what I ended up doing for 800 quid a day. Um, 
But it gets to the point where that you didn't get in to do that, so you have to start your own and do it yourself. It's the only way to do it. There is no way through. And what happens now is that we do all the work for free, and the mainstream nicks it. You know, you can guarantee at least once a week a Sulphur Star story ends up in the Daily, uh, sorry, the Manchester Evening News. There's some were on to me last week about a media city story we've done. You know, they're nicking it. We're doing all the research. We've got on the ground floor, and they steal it. Pay journalists. That's the problem we've got. Well, I think. I think what you what you're trying to get at is um, is it actually professional journalism or is it? And I think it has to be, otherwise we wouldn't be able to survive. It was all you know, facts were a bit inaccurate and things were just a bit sloppy. We'd be shut down. Not me. Like <laughs> no, but you are you are obviously a professional journalist and everything is accurate. You've got reliable sources. No, but I mean that's. I don't think you'll get around that. You can't yeah. just. I mean, obviously you could, but it's not like you know some kind of law where you just write something that's lining up the council. Obviously, everything has to be double checked. I think my point is that you don't have to be a trained and experienced journalist to be a good journalist. Oh right, you can build okay, those skills yeah. yourself. But but I think there is something that professional journalists can bring to this to this sector that's really important. And and my concern cool is fact. I'm not sure that this sector, if you want to call it, is open to that? I, I, I'm concerned. Well, mm. I speak, yeah, I mean, we got some funding and we put on workshops, free workshops for a month before we started doing anything else. And we got Guardian journalists and other journalists to come and do workshops for us and tell us how to do it. So that's one way. I mean, you know, they might not come and do it for free, but... I've been challenging on purpose here. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. I just don't think yeah. it's. I just don't think. I mean, the other way we right. interacted a bit, but I don't know whether it's really going to continue. Is that we've got stories that like into bits of like the Guardian's blogs and things about what we're doing. So, you know, it's sort of using the mass media as a way to advertise what you're doing locally. Um, if we've got, so yeah, this is going to be the last thing, and then we need to move to the next one. Yeah, I'll be. I was just part of yeah, from our perspective. I don't think we have that much to offer for like mainstream journalists, and a lot there's a kind of feeling of suspicion of like, what are your motives for coming into this? Because like, you, know, you kind of have to give up a lot of time. You're not kind of none of us feel like we're going to get anywhere in media journalism or blog writing or anything. This is just the kind of thing that's like us trying to represent like what we're going through right now, basically. Um, the other thing, the reason I put my hand up earlier was just like, if would it be feasible to just like write down the name of all the organisations we have at the front and then get that sent out to us all so we can communicate? Because I don't want to forget what everyone said and I'd like to be able to keep in touch sort of thing, like internationally sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, I think that in terms of mainstream journalism, I think that we're too small to really offer anything that anyone would have been touched right now. Maybe if we got bigger, but as it stands right now, we kind of just need to find a feet before we can start looking for like professionalisation. Cool. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>